All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. Today we're doing another book tour. I say another because I did the first one in my 3K AMA video, but that one didn't include a lot of the books that I actually do have. A lot of them were in my bedroom, some of them were at my dorm room, etc. So today we're getting a full book shirt. <laughs> so today we're getting a full bookshelf tour, and it's not really on a shelf, it's they're all kind of piled up next to me. And I say full in quotes because like 99% of my books are online. So you're getting 1% of my books, but that's okay. It's 1% fine enough. Oh, and also stay tuned to the end if you want to see some bonus soccer. I also have a bonus soccer playlist where in some of my videos I put little bits of bonus soccer at the end. I like soccer, so. All right, we're going to do this topically. I've got all my stuff out right here, and uh, we're just going to go through each of the topics, like metaphysics is right there, ethics, etc., 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 etc. All right, so we're going to be starting with the kind of generalist philosophy, and then we're going to move on to kind of history of philosophy and, like, actual kind of classical works, as it were. So let's begin with philosophy generally. So this one, I love it. And this, again, this is in no particular order other than the big batch. So Knowledge, Reality, and Value, a Mostly Common Sense Guide to Philosophy by Michael Humer. This is a beautiful book. Look at this. He has quotes from Plato. Look, Plato, quote, my work is a series of footnotes to Mike Humor. <laughs> this book is better than my lecture notes from Aristotle. This book is just amazing. Oh my goodness. Knowledge, reality, and value. He goes through some so preliminaries, like what is philosophy, logic, critical thinking. He talks about uh, how, you know, this fallacy rampage is kind of ludicrous. But, you know, he goes through epistemology, metaphysics, ethics. It's such a good book. It's so nice to get people into philosophy. Honestly, this is one that I would recommend, along with, of course, mine, The Majesty of Reason. I'd kind of recommend these to people who are just really starting to get into philosophy because he's such a great writer. It's super accessible. It's rigorous. He draws on even his own research in here, etc. So, excellent. I guess you can catch a glimpse of the back of my laptop. So, yes, I am a nerd. I really don't care. Philosophia, woohoo, and then that's really, that's really dull, isn't it? That's unfortunately dull, but corrupting the youth since 470 BC, and then you have the hemlock, of course. Um, so be jelly. The next one is, you know, a classic. This is one that really sparked my interest in philosophy. It is the Philosopher's Toolkit, a compendium of philosophical concepts and methods by Julian Bagini and Peter Fosel. This is really an exercise in what I call conceptual empowerment. It's giving you the concepts and the tools that you need really to be able to make distinctions and really to extend your sight into reality. So, you know, basic tools for arguments. He goes through more advanced tools like abduction, hypothetical deductive method, tools for conceptual distinctions, tools for assessment, etc. So highly recommended. This one is, I absolutely adore it, David Papineau's Philosophical Devices, Proofs, Probabilities, Possibilities, and Sets. He's basically giving you what you need to be able to understand most of the papers that are published in analytic philosophy. So he talks about sets, the axiom of comprehension, Russell set, etc., infinite sets, so what are the properties of infinite sets, orders of infinity, then he goes to analyticity, a prioricity and necessity, etc., etc., naming and necessity. Then he goes to the nature and uses of probability. He goes through Bayes' theorem, Kolmogorov's axioms, correlations and causes, constraints on credence, logic and theories, the distinction between syntax and semantics. So basically, like, genuinely philosophical devices. This is more conceptual empowerment. This will be able to get you into philosophy, be able to read boatloads of philosophical papers that you might have otherwise not understood. All right, on to the Majesty of Reason by Joseph C. Schmid. All right, that's me, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yes, Socrates, you're about to die. Stop being so dramatic, Barnabas. <laughs> so this is indeed a guide to critical thinking. I've got a little sonnet there that I myself wrote. I wrote that sonnet in high school and I was proud of it, so I included it. And then, of course, two beautiful quotes from Pythagoras and Baruch Spinoza. You can pause it if you want to read those. Anyway, I go through setting the stage first. So that's about tribalism and how we can try to combat our tribalistic and polarizing instincts. And then I get into the methods and tools of critical thinking. And so that's basically like how to analyze arguments. What are different ways you can analyze arguments? When a scientific study is used, how do you analyze that? How do you measure validity of psychological studies, for instance? Because those are brought up in various fields. How do you use Bayes' theorem in the context of philosophy, etc.? And then I go through three different tangible areas. So I go through scientism and I apply the method, methods and tools. Same with laws of nature and mind. So yeah, uh, pick up the book if you're interested. More precisely, the math you need to do philosophy, Eric Steinhardt. I've had him on my channel. He's a very, very interesting and funny guy. So this is indeed the math you need to do philosophy. Like, I highly, highly recommend this. It's just beautiful. I mean, if you're like me, I, I really like math, so... <laughs> But even if you don't like math, this is, again, more conceptual empowerment. It goes through sets and relations and information theory, semantics, machines, probability. Like, what is what is a sample space? What is Bayes' theorem? How do you use this sorts of thing? What are degrees of belief, etc.? So, 
Definitely check that out. Oh, this one is so beautiful. Just the arguments. 100 of the most important arguments in Western philosophy. So let's just read the back because I kind of want to give this a plug. And, you know, all these these guys should, like, pay me or something. So this one says, Philosophers don't just make claims, they give arguments. Does the existence of evil call into doubt the existence of God? Show me the argument. Will living a just life lead to happiness? Show me the argument. Philosophy starts with questions, but attempts at answers are just as important. And these answers require a reasoned argument. Cutting through notoriously dense and verbose philosophical prose, the author set 100 famous and influential arguments in context, including key quotations to explain the original style and approach. Each argument is laid bare in its essential form, with premises and conclusions plainly identified and the form of the argument specified. Designed to offer a quick and compact reference to everything from Aquinas' five ways to prove the existence of God to the metaphysical possibilities of zombie minds, just the arguments is an invaluable one-stop argument shop. And it really is. Like, they go through, like, the central arguments in philosophy, 100 of the most important arguments in Western philosophy. And, you know, you'll see, like, Quine's Two Dogmas of Empire and, you know, they basically are enlisting the help of scholars in the field to basically put in syllogistic form the central arguments that have been developed in the history of Western thought. The next two go together, Philosophy 1 and Philosophy 2. So these are highly, highly recommended. Philosophy 1, A Guide Through the Subject, edited by A.C. Grayling, and then Philosophy 2, Further Through the Subject. These, again, are edited collections, and so it's basically just scholars in the field who are just basically writing introductory essays that give you a survey of like a lay of the land for each of the philosophical branches. So you got epistemology, philosophical logic, methodology. This one gets into ancient philosophy, ethics, and aesthetics. And then this one gets into philosophy of religion, philosophy of art, I think, is in here, etc. So I highly recommend these for people who want to uh, to get into philosophy further. Next up is The Experience of Philosophy, 6th edition, by Daniel Kolak and Raymond Martin. This is basically like an edited collection that has some cool central essays that have been written in various fields in philosophy. So Daniel Dennett's, for instance, Where Am I? Uh, you have What's It Like to Be a Bat in here. You have just a lot of the really cool, like like Kant, etc., John Stuart Mill, Bennett, just a lot of the kind of central things that, that you need to read <laughs> if you want to get into philosophy. Like it's got stuff on death, meaning, consciousness, experience, um, and uh, reality. Ignore all this uh, crazy <laughs> I think I did a reading list at one point and I was like crossing them off when I was finished. Anyway, it's got Anton Aquinas, Pascal, Clifford, you know, it just goes through everything basically. So it's a really nice like anthology of primary texts. So this is, this is really valuable. Next up is just, you know, your Barnes and Noble philosophy one and 101. It's kind of illustrated, I think, was it? No, I was wrong. But anyway, it's pretty good. It's a, uh, it's a nice simple introduction that you could give to your uncle at Thanksgiving. This one is kind of a companion to this uh, Just the Arguments. It's bad arguments, 100 of the most important fallacies in Western philosophy. Now, beware of, you know, just pointing out fallacy, fallacy, fallacy everywhere you see an argument that you might think goes wrong. Uh, that's not the way we go about critical thinking. But this does go through some pretty interesting and important fallacies that people should be aware of. Things like mistakes in reasoning. Uh, so it goes through formal fallacies and informal fallacies like fallacies of relevance, uh, burden of proof, illicitly shifting that, um, fallacies of presumption, etc. And it also goes through some biases. So you can see, for instance, confirmation bias. This one is, I haven't read this one, actually. Yeah, it's Kevin Vost, Vost, maybe? How to Think Like Aquinas. I think this is actually my father's. I kind of stole it from him. It says, a sure way to protect your mental powers. So, I mean, I think it's got things in here like tips on how to memorize things. It's kind of cool. And basically like tips on how to navigate streams of knowledge. Just to speak slowly and carry a big heart and mind, etc. So it, it looks interesting. I really should. I mean, it looks, you know, not super in-depth philosophy. But still, this is, I mean, it could be interesting. So I also haven't read this one. Uh, but Six Questions of Socrates by Christopher Phillips. A Modern Day Journey of discovery through world philosophy. And then, of course, for the general philosophy, you have to know how to write in philosophy, at least if you're doing classes and at least if you're publishing. So this is one that's really recommended, Lewis Vaughn, Writing Philosophy, A Student's Guide to Reading and Writing Philosophy Essays. So if you want to know, how, how do you read all these sorts of things? <laughs> you can get this book. It's like it tells you how to read them, how to decipher arguments, what are some of the, the, the clue words, and also tells you how to write and structure essays and so on, like how do you read philosophy, how do you read an argument, knowing the basics of deductive and inductive arguments. So this is pretty good. And then, of course, the claimed elements of style. So yeah, this is basically like how to be a good writer. So elementary rules of usage, etc. All right, so we're done with general philosophy. And now we are on to history of philosophy slash kind of classics. So the first up for history of philosophy, and I think I have more of these. So I said that this collection was basically complete, but it's actually probably 99% of my physical books. I think I have more of these because I know that they, they come in many, many, like, you know, you could have these stacked up all the way up here. But, uh, but anyway, here are two that I 
picked out. These are Frederick Copleston's histories of philosophy, and they are relatively unparalleled in terms of histories of philosophy. They're just stellar. So this one is, yeah, Greece and Rome from the pre-Socratics to Plotinus, and then Descartes, René Descartes, to Leibniz, Hobbes, Hume, Wolf, Kant. Anyway, onward we march to... Al-Ghazali, as Craig would say, on knowing yourself in God. This one's really interesting. We had to read this for our history of medieval philosophy class. It's interesting. It talks about, like, the na- it, it's a lot of it is about the nature of humans, but also the nature of God. So it's super interesting. And he talks about, like, different analogies for humans, like, I think it was like a wolf and a pig and these other sorts of things. And it just, it's highlighting different aspects and dispositions that humans have and how to cultivate ones that are better. Super interesting stuff by Al-Ghazali. Next up is Teresa of Avila, The Book of Her Life. She just basically details some of her mystical experiences. We had to read this for one of my classes with Paul Draper. It was interesting because she is unparalleled in her ability to articulate the phenomenology of her mystical experiences. She gives, like, analogies, and, I mean, although it's still kind of ineffable, right, she's still able to convey a lot of what she was feeling, the states in which she was in. Like, by her lights, she was able to decipher whether or not it was a divinely originated mystical experience. I'd say if you're looking to study religious experience, it's something that you could definitely pick up. Rudolf Otto, Das Eilige. Das Eilige, the idea of the holy. This is one of Paul Draper's absolute favorite books. He basically just talks about the numinous, numinous experiences. Numinous experiences are something like, it's almost like you have feelings of mystery, of awe, of being overpowered by something, a kind of sense of energy or urgency, a kind of liveliness. Um, it, it's simultaneously fascinating, but also kind of kind of scary because you're you're so minute in comparison to this vast cosmic reality that you're kind of experiencing. You have this kind of creature feeling. You feel almost like you're nothing in comparison to this this awful, this awesome, this overpowering, this holy other mysterious, amazing sort of reality that you're experiencing. So he talks about the numinous. And he, again, he, like Teresa of Avila, is very good at describing uh, what this sort of experience is like. Next up is Anselm. This is basically one of those medieval guys who sort of writes like an analytic philosopher, so it's wonderful to go through this. Interestingly, guys, like, Anselm's work is underappreciated because, you know, people tend to focus on his ontological arguments, but there's so much in his corpus that has nothing to do with ontological arguments. He goes into lots of interesting stuff in here, but, um... Yeah. Next up is Maimonides, the guide of the perplexed. In here, he gives this kind of like super duper high octane classical theism. It's like, you know, you read Aquinas and you're like, yeah, this guy's a pretty high octane classical theist. But then you come to Maimonides and you're like, oh my goodness. Maimonides is writing before Aquinas, but you can find basically something that, an argument that's almost identical to Aquinas' third way in here. But anyway, um, yeah, I got Moses Maimonides here. More Anselm, his proslogion, or some people say proslogion, with the replies of Gonalo and Anselm or Guanilo, or Gaunilo, you know, people pronounce it differently. Parker Pansies, David Hume, Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. So this is, of course, the tour de force of, what is Hume? Is he early modern? Yeah, I think so. This is the, basically the tour de force of uh, skeptical or atheistic early modern philosophy. So, you know, he has his famous criticisms, the design argument in here, etc. Um, he's got Cleanthes and, and all, those, all those sorts of people. Augustine on free choice of the will. I love Augustine because he was a rhetorician, and so you're basically, like, reading a lot of his insults, which are hilarious. He also, I mean, there's just so many beautiful lines in here. People cry out that they are happy when they passionately embrace the beautiful bodies of their spouses and even of prostitutes. And shall we doubt that we are happy in embracing the truth? People cry out that they are happy when, with throats parched by the heat, they come upon a wholesome and abundant spring, or when they are starving and find an elaborate feast. And shall we deny that we are happy when our thirst is quenched and our hunger appeased by the truth itself? We often hear voices crying out that they are happy if they lie among roses or other flowers, or enjoy the incomparable scent of the finest perfumes. What is more fragrant, more delightful, than the gentle breath of truth? And shall we doubt that we are happy when it breathes upon us? Many find their happiness in the music of voices and strings and flutes. When they are without it, they think they are miserable, and when they have it, they are in raptures. So when the silent eloquence of truth flows over us without the clamor of voices, shall we look for some other happiness and not enjoy the one that is so secure and so near at hand? People take pleasure in the cheerfulness and brightness of light, in the glitter of gold and silver, in the brilliance of gems, and in the radiance of colors, and of that very light that belongs to our eyes, whether in earthly fires or in the stars or the sun or the moon. As long as no poverty or violence deprives them of this joy, they think that they are happy. They want to live forever to enjoy such a happiness. 
And shall we fear to find our happiness in the light of truth? So I literally just turned to a random page and started reading. So <laughs> that's what you're getting when you read that. Next up is Boethius, an absolute must read, The Consolation of Philosophy. So much symbolism in here and just lots of super cool reflections on fate and how it has to do with his situation in life. He wrote this, I think, when he was in like a, a prison cell or whatever. Poetry in here, it's just, it's a masterpiece, literarily speaking. Literarily, I think that's a word. And philosophically speaking. Next up is one of my absolute favorites, Augustine's Confessions. There's just so much in here that, uh, you know, he deals with temptation, he deals with debauchery, he deals with all, all of his various sins, and then he overcomes them. You know, he's got sexual sin, he's enslaved to it, and he has this extended reflection on when he stole a pear, and, like, what it means, and, like, he stole it just for the sake of stealing, and then he reflects on the nature of good, and then he develops his privation theory. So it's, like, it's just this beautiful interweaving of literature and philosophy and theology and all these sorts of things. So I highly recommend Augustine's Confessions. Immanuel Kant, I highly recommend not reading this. With a synthesis of every new concept in the aggregation of coordinate characteristics, the extensive or complex distinctness is increased. With a further analysis of concepts in the series of subordinate characteristics, the intensive or deep distinctness is increased. The latter kind of distinctness, as it necessarily serves the thoroughness and conclusiveness of cognition, is therefore mainly the business of philosophy and is carried farthest, especially in metaphysical investigations. Nice. Yeah, so so don't read Kant. Okay, fine, you can read Kant. I'm sorry. I I'm really not sorry. Okay, Blaise Pascal, Pensez, or uh, as uh, Parker over at Parker's Pansies pronounces it, Pansies? 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 So, of course, there's the famous wager in here, but there's a lot more. <laughs> so, Pascal's one of the most underrated Christian thinkers in the tradition, so check it out if you're interested in that. David Hume, Selected Essays. That's a beautiful cover, isn't it? Oh my goodness. So if you want to look into Hume, you can get this book. And finally, for history slash classics, um, again, I know I don't have any, like, Plato or Aristotle in here. That's because I have them virtually, people. Uh, George Berkeley, if you say Berkeley, we can't be friends. A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge. Of course, that's just the shortened title, A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge. It's really A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge, Part 1, wherein the chief causes of error and difficulty in the sciences, with the grounds of skepticism, atheism, and irreligion, are inquired into. By George Berkeley, M.A. Fellow of Trinity College, Dublin. Edited with an introduction by Kenneth P. Winkler. Who he is? So yeah, he's got his famous or maybe infamous arguments for idealism in here, but he's also got a lot of other stuff. So talking about the nature of perception and lots of really cool stuff. So this is one of the ones that I actually really enjoyed reading and I was surprised because George Barkley, he's really, he's really engaging. Look, I literally wrote, <laughs> I turned to a random page and it says Kane B. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Something triggered my mind to think about Kane B or something when I was, when I was doing this. Um, you can see I underlined a lot, but that's because this is probably a portion that I had to write an essay on. So um, I was basically underlining things that I could, <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, so um, I was probably underlining things that I could potentially quote. Very underrated as well. Him and Pascal are quite underrated. All right, so that concludes uh, the history of philosophy and classics together with uh, the uh, philosophical, together with philosophy more generally. So I, if we compare the theories, anyway, now we are on to free will and I only have three books. So this is the one that I'd recommend you get first uh, out, of, out of those <laughs> because it is a really good introduction by Robert Kane. He's one of the biggest players in the field. And yeah, it's a really good introduction. It talks about the consequence argument and manipulation arguments and what are actions and what are th different theories of action, agent causal theories, event causal theories, non-causal theories. Uh, how does indeterminism play into this? The luck objection, all these different sorts of really cool things, right? <laughs> it's very accessible. This is one that's not gonna be super duper technical. If you have a passing interest in philosophy, you're going to be able to understand this if you pick it up. So this is one that I highly recommend picking up first. Uh, for those who are interested in more daunting tasks, get this. This is unparalleled in terms of being a book on free will. It's a contemporary introduction that basically gives you the lay of the land in like all of contemporary debates concerning free will, concerning the nature of reasons, reason-based action, compatibilism, incompatibilism, libertarian views of free will, different objections to the various views, all the various different arguments. And more generally, these Rutledge contemporary introductions to philosophy are, like, unparalleled. They're better than anything that Oxford produces, anything that Cambridge produces. <laughs> Highly recommend basically everything that this Rutledge contemporary introductions pu puts out. Different, I mean, look at all this beautiful juiciness. I love it, okay? <laughs> look at all this beautiful juiciness. Never thought I'd say that. And the next one, edited by John Martin Fisher and Patrick Todd, Freedom, Fatalism, and Foreknowledge. This is kind of the intersection between metaphysics, philosophy of time, philosophy of religion 
philosophy of language, lots of cool areas that are intersecting here. Um, but it's, again, it's an edited collection, and it, it basically looks at arguments for fatalism, looks at the problem of foreknowledge and how these sorts of, it basically just different challenges to, to free will. So those are the three books on free will that we're going to be going through. And next up is ethics. So first up, this is another one of those where if you have no training in philosophy, you can absolutely pick this up and understand basically every single word. So this is amazing. It's Applied Ethics and Impartial Introduction by Liz Jackson, Tyron Goldschmidt, Dustin Crummett, and Rebecca Chan. I've had three out of four of those authors on my channel. Yeah, so it talks about abortion, animal ethics, environmental ethics, charitable giving, punishment, disability, etc. And it really is an impartial introduction. You're going to hear both sides and they trace out the dialectic. They say like, Here's the argument. Here's an objection. And then they have, like, reply to objection. Reply to reply. Like, you should see some of these. <laughs> it, gets, it gets kind of funny. Look. Uh, reply to the reply to the reply to the reply to the reply. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Next up is another treasure in conceptual empowerment, the ethics toolkit. It's a compendium of ethical concepts and methods. So, again, it's basically just giving you the various tools and methods and conceptual distinctions to be able to follow debates in ethics. And in terms of meta-ethics... The Foundations of Ethics and Anthology. This will basically get you up to date in meta-ethics. It's very big. It's very thick. 12 C's thick. We use this in one of my grad seminars with philosopher Pat Kane. Next up, uh, I haven't read this one at all, but uh, it's in there. Bioethics Across the Lifespan. Next up is More Conceptual Empowerment, a 21st Century Ethical Toolbox. So once again, this is giving you the tools to be able to think critically in the context of ethics. And then I put this in ethics because it has to do with, well, it's really political philosophy, but listen, I don't do political philosophy. So yeah, um, I'm not an anarcho-capitalist, nor am I an anarchist, uh, but this book does a nice job in articulating the various problems and giving a lay of the land of what political authority is, what justifies it, different contractualist theory. He, you know, he goes through a bunch of different theories and points out some of their prospects, but also mainly their, their problems. And it turns out it's actually exceedingly difficult to justify political authority. So anyway, this is basically humorous case for anarcho-capitalism. So if you have an edgy teen near you, go ahead and send this to them. Their edginess is going to be like over 9,000. Next up is metaphysics. First up, more Rutledge Contemporary Introduction. So this is the philosophy of time. I haven't gotten a chance to go through this yet. Oh, I'm so sad. Um, so yeah, you can see I have not gone through this one yet. It's a Rutledge Contemporary Introduction one, so I had to get it. It's actually super duper recent. That's kind of the reason why I haven't got, been able to get into it yet. Next up is Infinity Causation in Paradox. You know, the extended case for causal finitism. This is, I put this in the metaphysics section because this is actually... Almost all of this is metaphysics. It's talking about infinity, different paradoxes, how to kill paradoxes, etc. There's a lot of math in here as well. It's only in like the last chapter that it talks about some of the potential uh, philosophy of religion implications. Next up is one of my absolute favorite books in philosophy, The Atlas of Reality, A Comprehensive Guide to Metaphysics. Thankfully, I have this in hardcover. <laughs> but yeah, it's by Rob Coons and Timothy Pickavans. But this really is a comprehensive guide to metaphysics. Oh my goodness. This is like 40 C's thick. It's almost like 700 pages and... Wow, just wow. It goes through, like, everything in metaphysics. I found it, like, truth makers, grounding, ontological dependence, fundamentality, dispositions, universals in particular. It's like, all this glorious stuff that you could talk to people at parties and you can get all the girls to talk about space and time and whether or not relational theory or absolute theory is true. Next up is the Lux and Crisp, more con Rutledge contemporary introduction. This is the Lux and Crisp metaphysics book. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Yet another survey of metaphysics isn't as long and as grueling, shall we say, as this one. But... Highly, highly recommended. This is a very, very good book, and uh, you can see that I definitely made <laughs> made my use of that one. Next up is Plato's Problem, so an introduction to mathematical Platonism. Next up is Actuality, Possibility, and Worlds by Alexander Proust. This one convinced me of a branching theory of modality, or a causal powers-based view of modality, where something is possible, just in case it's either actual or it's the potential outworking of the causal powers of actual things. So, so very interesting and very forcefully argued. This one is not for the faint of heart, right? There's a lot of, a lot of symbol, symbolism in here, etc., etc., right? So next up is a philosophical classic, Naming and Necessity by Saul Kripke. Got David Oderberg, Real Essentialism. This one's really fun. I put it in metaphysics just because it has to do with paradoxes, but it's Matt Cook, Slight of Mind, 75 Ingenious Paradoxes in Mathematics, Physics, and Philosophy. So yeah, you'll find super cool paradoxes in here. The Littlewood Ross Paradox, the Liar Paradox, Self-Reference Paradoxes, Game Theory, Social Choice Paradoxes, Paradoxes of Motion, Super Tasks, Probability Paradoxes, etc. Next up is Peter Van Inwagen, Existence, Essays in Ontology. Another classic, Alvin Plantinga, The Nature of Necessity. 
Next up is Edward Fazer, Aristotle's Revenge, The Metaphysical Foundations of Physical and Biological Science. I've had to use this a lot in my research, especially my forthcoming book, Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs, with Springer. Ooh, next up is a really fun one, The Puzzle of Existence, Why Is There Something Rather Than Nothing, edited by Tyron Goldschmidt. This one is so cool. It's basically like a bunch of different, so it's an edited collection, right? So it's a bunch of different authors talking about the principle of sufficient reason, about contingency arguments, about the nature of necessity, about whether, you know, indeterministic causation, about conceivability, and etc. Timothy O'Connor, could there be a complete explanation of everything? Graham Oppie, ultimate naturalistic causal explanation. Reasoning without the principle of sufficient reason by Shiva Kleinschmidt. The principle of sufficient reason and the grand inexplicable by Jacob Ross. Contingency dependence and the ontology of the many. Conceiving absolute greatness. Methodological separatism, modal pluralism, and metaphysical nihilism. So whether or not there could be an empty world devoid of absolutely everything. So a world in which absolutely nothing exists. And so on. So yeah, John Heil talking about the nature of contingency. Stephen Meitzen questioning the question. Like saying that it's not even legitimate to ask that why is there something rather than nothing. So this is a really good book in metaphysics and uh, basically essential reading for anyone who's, who's interested in contingency arguments. You're going to find a lot of challenging ideas in here, but also lot, lots of gold. Next up, along those lines, could there have been nothing against metaphysical nihilism? So metaphysical nihilism is not the view that everything is absurd or meaningless. <laughs> metaphysical nihilism is the view that there could have been nothing. There could have been a world in which absolutely nothing exists. No numbers, no people, nothing. Absolutely nothing. And then an Aristotelian realist philosophy of mathematics. All right, next up is philosophy of religion. And I'm just going to stand up for this one. Examining Schellenberg's Hiddenness Argument by Veronica Widener. Maybe it's Widener. Widener. This is a very good critical examination of J.L. Schellenberg's Divine Hiddenness Argument. So if you're interested in the Hiddenness Argument, I highly recommend picking this one up. Next up is The Existence of God, the second edition by Richard Swinburne. The Existence of God is the central book of all that I've written on the philosophy of religion. It was originally published in 1979, that is to say, one year before 1980. A substance has properties. So, if you're interested, pick it up. No, but anyway, this is a classic. This is excellent, excellent, excellent. Pick it up if you're interested in the existence of God. I mean, that's the title after all, isn't it? Two Dozen or So Arguments for God, edited by Jerry Walls and Trent Doherty. Lots of really interesting, non-traditional style arguments in here. Ah, yes, insert the necessary joke about God to lead can reason how. Uh, no, how reason can lead to God by, uh, by, no, not a philosopher's bridge to faith, by Joshua Rasmussen. Also, all you people who say, like, Rasmussen, or things like that, I'm pretty sure that's wrong. It is Rasmussen, right? Say it with me, Rasmussen, okay? There we go. Acknowledgements. Joseph Schmid, it's me, and Mario, and uh, someone with the last name McNutt. Next up, I have two copies of this because I read these in like seventh grade or something, and and these are also kind of what put me down the path of philosophy of religion. So these are kind of just historical here for me. The Language of God, written by Francis Collins, um, talks about the relationship between faith and reason, talks about how Christianity is compatible with evolution and makes the case for theistic evolution. Divine Omniscience and Human Free Will, a logical and metaphysical analysis. So check that one out if you're interested. The Contradictory Christ. Ah, J.C. Beale. I've had him on my channel. I had him on with Mike DeVito. Both of them are working on super fascinating stuff having to do with non-classical logics and the possibility of gluts. And, lo and behold, this is signed by the man himself, J.C. Beale. Basically, for those of you who don't know, he argues that Precisely that. Christ is a contradictory being. Uh, and he's a, he's a full-blown Christian, right? And he says that this is, he actually makes a case, and he, and he argues against other models of the incarnation. But yeah, he's saying that, yes, there are true contradictions. Like, literally, things are both true and false of Christ. He's both peccable and he's not peccable. He's both limited and not limited, etc. Precisely because he has a human nature and a divine nature, right? It's precisely because he has these two natures that you get these incompatible predicates being true of this one thing. Christ. Next up, this one's pretty interesting, and uh, I draw on some- of Oh no, what are you doing? I draw on some of this in my forthcoming Springer book, but yeah, Change of the Arrow of Time and Divine Eternity in Light of Relativity Theory by Daniel Soudek. A really interesting and innovative book. Next up is Believing in Dawkins, The New Spiritual Atheism, Eric Steinhardt. So what Eric Steinhardt does in here is very interesting. He basically looks at the various things that Dawkins has said throughout his corpus, and what Steinhardt does is he kind of builds up a kind of edifice. It builds up a worldview, a philosophical worldview, a highly philosophical worldview. And it's like sprinkled with Neoplatonism, sprinkled with Platonism, the forms, abstract objects, plus like this um, Neoplatonic, absolutely simple one, etc. Like he literally d develops all this from what uh, Richard Dawkins says. And he basically shows how it can complete uh, Richard Dawkins' worldview, etc. So it's, it's super interesting. It's like developing a Dawkinsian worldview, which is 
atheistic, but it's not, it's not like the kind of crude materialism and nihilism and so on. Like you have a robust moral realism going on here. You have meaning, you have um, transcendent realities, you have room for liturgy and so on. It's super interesting. He develops, he explores the spiritual dimensions of Richard Dawkins's books and he develops a kind of worldview on the basis of it. And he makes room for meaning and purpose in life, really like objective, true meaning and purpose, an appreciation of platonic beauty and truth, a deep belief in the rationality of the universe and an aversion to both scientism and nihilism. So this is an antidote to all the people who say that, like, atheism is, you know, inextricably tied to this atheistic, reductive, materialistic worldview. No, like, like this is bordering on, like, Pythagorean and, or Platonic mysticism, almost. <laughs> but it's atheistic, nonetheless. So atheism is perfectly compatible with there being, like, super robust, maybe we can say metaphysically profligate views of reality. Next up is James Sturba, Is a Good God Logically Possible? He develops a new logical problem of evil in here. <clears throat> logical problems of evil don't work, right? So it fails. But, you know, it's a good attempt, isn't it? Ah, yes, Peter Berger, The Sacred Canopy. So this is more so, like, almost sociological theory of religion. Next up is The Problem of Animal Pain, A Theodicy for All Creatures Great and Small by Trent Doherty. Very interesting response to the, the problem of animal suffering. I believe Draper has a forthcoming manuscript on the problem of evil, wherein he systematically addresses Trent Doherty's theodicy here. So look out for that. Next up is the two books by Gavin Kerr, or Kerr, Aquinas' Way to God, The Proof in the Dei Antea Descentia, and Aquinas and the Metaphysics of Creation. I also draw heavily on these in my forthcoming manuscript. Next up is another book in religious studies, which is from Marcea Eliada, The Sacred and the Profane, The Nature of Religion. Next up is Michael Agros, who designed the designer, or rediscovered paths to God's existence. It's kind of like a popular presentation of a quasi-Thomistic argument for God's existence, which, being viewers of my channel, you are equipped with many ways to respond to those sorts of arguments. Um, next up, uh, the author of this, Thomas J. Ward, actually sent me this, so I'm very, very thankful to him. Pluriform Love, an Open and Relational Theology of Well-Being. And then finally, Michael Suddeth, a Philosophical Critique of Empirical Arguments for Postmortem Survivals. So if you're interested in NDEs and telepathy and these other sorts of things, and how they might have an evidential bearing on uh, views about the afterlife and other sorts of things, I highly recommend checking out this book. It's a philosophical critique of the use of NDEs in favor of uh, not only NDEs, but other sorts of uh, parapsych parapsychological phenomena, or whatever they're called. So anyway, check this out for a good skeptical case against the evidential efficacy or probative value of those. But anyway, that concludes philosophy of religion, and on now to science slash popular science. All right, so I'm going to be quick with these. I got this so long ago. Um, oh my goodness, ASAP Science. So ASAP Science, that is a YouTube channel, and um, they have some really interesting videos about, uh, you know, they're just about popularizing science. So um, interesting, and I, I got this book just because I was, I'm a curious fella, um, or at least I, I was back then. Now I just make YouTube videos. All right, the next one. Definitely don't inquire as to what that mark is. But anyway, <laughs> Evolution's Edge, The Coming Collapse and Transformation of Our World. Going to, oh yes, this what if book. This one's interesting, like a bunch of hypotheticals and it draws science, math, and so on. Interesting stuff in here. Uh, expo oh, this one's fun. I love this one. Exploring Evolution, Michael Allen Park talks about the evidence for evolution, but also just like the beauties of it. I mean, of course, you know, it's a process that's fraught with suffering and those sorts of things. But uh, but still, this is really what sparked a lot of my interest in evolutionary biology. So, you know, it talks about how do we know that the Earth is 4.54 billion years old, and how has it changed over these various eons? It talks about evolutionary history and, like, the evidence for evolution, like, lots of just really, it is so nice. Like, it's basically um, a super accessible, very short, like, as you can see, textbook on evolution. So um, if you want to read the back, I will just hover this over here. I also have an interest in neuroscience, so this is the tale of the dueling neurosurgeons, the history of the human brain, as revealed by true stories of trauma, madness, and recovery. Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, Donald Goldsmith wrote something called Origins, 14 Billion Years of Cosmic Evolution. Ah, yes, God, Evolution, and the Question of the Cosmos, Origins. So um, I remember getting this when I was like in seventh or eighth grade, when I was really interested in the, uh, the relationship between between science and faith and evolution and how it related to Genesis and so on. Ah, yes, a short guide to writing about biology. The complete middle school study guide to everything you need to ace science in one big fat notebook. Okay. This is kind of more conceptual empowerment, right? If you know what an amplitude is and crest is and wavelength and these sorts of things, like different properties of waves uh, and resistance and all these sorts of things, buoyancy and density. So anyway, like these sorts of things, they seem kind of simple, but like if you equip yourself with these sorts of things, like you'll be able to engage, for instance, in debates concerning philosophy of science because you have more things, you have more knowledge in your toolkit about how science works and these various concepts. You can bring in examples. So some of it sounds kind of simple, but anyway. 
Uh, Mark Lane, the vital question. I remember getting this one, but unfortunately I didn't read it. So yeah, energy, evolution, and the origins of complex life. Richard Dawkins, the selfish gene. Did you know, fun fact, Richard Dawkins was the inventor of the word meme. So yeah, Dawkins. You can thank Dawkins for meme culture. Um, but yeah, I kid you not, he's the one who introduced meme into uh, basically the English language. Now, of course, he kind of introduced memes as like units of cultural transmission, I think. And they're basically the analog, the cultural analogs to uh, biological genes. And he says that they, they basically undergo their own kind of evolution and uh, replication and so on. Uh, and they face their own kind of selective pressures. So it's interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, but... Um, Meme Lord Dawkins. Ah, yes. Visualized Earth in 60 seconds. Steven Pinker. How the mind were... Oh, crap. Ah, I love this book. Um, so, you know, I'm quite critical of Dawkins. Show me the evidence. 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 But his stuff in biology, especially popularizing biology, is just stellar. Like, this is really good. The greatest show on Earth. Um, wow. This talks about the evidence behind evolution, and it conveys it so wonderfully. So if you have a creationist friend, you can send this to them, and it might help them see the truth. All right, done with the science. Now on to self-help slash math. Keep your brain alive. This is interesting. These are like aerobic exercises to help prevent memory loss and increase mental fitness. So basically, it just talks about different things you can do. Big brain games. <laughs> it should be, should be giga-chad brain games. Okay, yeah, so th this just contains a lot of really interesting challenges, like with numbers and so on. This one is super interesting. Moonwalking with Einstein. Oh my goodness. This one like changed my life. This was so interesting. Basically shows you how, like there, there are these competitions. You might not know this, but there are these competitions. And I think they're called like um, memory championships or something like that. But like people enter into them, just these normal people. But they basically, they train their memory in certain ways and they have various tools. And they go into these memory competitions and they're able to memorize decks of cards, an entire deck of cards in like two minutes, you know, things like that. Like they, they study it and you know, I think some of them have gotten under two minutes, but they, they, uh, they have these really interesting systems. So it's like they use the method of loci or loci or whatever that you guys might've heard of. This basically just goes through how to memorize these sorts of things. You can memorize speeches and poems by doing it. You can do it with, uh, it's so interesting. Okay, anyway, 100 essential things you didn't know, you didn't know. <laughs> okay, entertain your brain. This is more of the big brain game sort of thing. And then yes, my beloved math tests, math contests. So I did a lot of math contests, as you can see. Next up is literature. So firstly, we have G.K. Chesterton, uh, Essential Writings. We have Brave New World, which I absolutely love. I love Brave New World. The Perennial Philosophy by Aldous Huxley. Flowers for Algernon. I quite I quite enjoyed this one for some reason. I really enjoyed this one. It was really interesting. Uh, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit. Uh, Things Fall Apart. Oconquo. Oconquo's my man, even though he was a uh, very toxic. He was very toxic. Hamlet. Of course, you have to have some Shakespeare, right? High culture. The Visit by Friedrich Jarnmatt. Alles Gute zum Geburtstag. A Midsummer's Night Dream. More Shakespeare. More Shakespeare. <laughs> Twelfth Night. Brave New World yet again. Mouse. Probably going to get demonetized if I show this. John Steinbeck, The Grapes of Wrath. Arsene Wenger. That's some soccer. Cyrano de Bergerac. Poor dude. Had a huge nose and that basically ruined his life, it seems. Homer, The Odyssey. More Shakespeare. Hamlet. C.S. Lewis, The Last Battle. Joseph, Peeper or Piper, Only the Lover Sings. Art and Contemplation. Sophocles, the Theban plays. George Orwell, very Orwellian. Oh, this one was fun. I like this one. Tim O'Brien, The Things They Carried. That one was fun. Talks about um, back in Nam. Talks about uh, a soldier's experience in Vietnam and basically how it affected him and how he saw it affect lots of his other friends and basically the psychological deterioration that it caused him. Um, yeah, basically what you learn from this is that war is hell. And then another thing that will cause me to get demonetized. All right, and then this is basically some textbooks that I still have. Some of my textbooks I've sold to other people, other ones that are, they're like up in my room. Basically, I didn't really care. I just, you know, took some of the textbooks that I have down here and just piled them in. So uh, I say textbooks, but these are some of the things that I had to like forcibly read that didn't have to do with philosophy or s things like that or literature. So uh, Rise to Globalism, That's I had to read that for an economics class. We Need to Talk, basically how to have conversations that matter. This was, this was, this was not a bad book. This uh, basically gives you tips for Having Productive Conversations. I read this for Economics, The Travels of a T-Shirt in the Global Economy. Okay, Examining Markets, Power, and the Politics of World Trade. Sorry, but boring. The Metaphysical Club, A Story of Ideas in America, Authoritarian States, uh, Fidel Castro. Oh, yes, this one, Readings, Phil 275, Philosophy of Art. This one was very interesting. So, like, 
looked at Plato and how he was crapping on artists, looked at Nelson Goodman, René Descartes, uh, Danto, lots of interesting pieces that had been published in the philosophy of art. This one was Fate and Free Will, so we basically had um, to read Taylor, Ekstrom, Vivalin, Fisher, Davison, etc. Um, Free Will, that one was Michael Bergman. Ah, uh, yes, Alistair McGrath, his Christian theology. This is this is really good if you want to just like, what is Christianity? If you, if you want to know what Christianity is, <laughs> read this book. Uh, United States government. I'm surprised that this book is in working order. That was a joke. The methods and skills of history are practical. So this one is interesting. This is basically like how historians do history. Like this isn't just like your, this isn't just a collection of stories or anything. Like this is, this is the methods and tools of history. This is interesting. These are the sorts of things that I find interesting. Emi libro de español. Uh, Suso Rodriguez Blanco in Ana Valbuena. Pues, hablo español un poquito. Fue interesante. And then, oh, <laughs> oh glorious. Uh, yeah, so this is yet another Spanish book. Um, Realidades 2, um, Edición Digital. And then back here, this, a lot of this stuff is basically from Catholic education. So, uh, the church, Christ in the world, Eucharistic miracles, the incorruptibles, Bible, the living word of God, an actual Bible, uh, the mystery of redemption and crystal, crystal disciple, <laughs> crystal discipleship. Oh man, I'm in pain. Life, the signs of biology. Okay, fine. A biology book. Nice. The social doctrine of the Catholic church, introduction to Catholicism, a complete course, the blessed Trinity and our Christian vocation, psychology principles in practice, the history of the church, a complete course, understanding the scriptures, a complete course on Bible study, our moral life in Christ, a complete course, economics, principles and practices, neuroscience, exploring the brain, that one's a really nice, that, that is a nice textbook, uh, chemistry, matter and change, more chemistry, <laughs> okay, and then, all of a twist. Think I didn't take risk to get I to this. Just wanted some more. All of a twist. Think I didn't take risk to get to this sitch. Don't take the piss. Well, I've me. I admit I did what I did, but I deserve it. Well, I guess I could show more in depth what's be what's behind me. Arsenal fan parking only. And then look at this little guy. He's got his little Arsenal shirt there, and he, his hair is like flicked up. And then we got Memento Scully. Remember your death. Remember your finitude. I'm your mortal. That's what he's saying to me. Then we got a little little piggy bank here. Uh, a tortoise. I haven't named this thing. I Did you know that I used to have a tortoise? Its name was Norman. It, I, I even gave it a middle name, Norman Lewis. And then an Arsenal clock. And then, of course, we got my uh, Arsenal scarf here. Sorry. All right, so that's going to have to do it for the book tour, the extended book tour. Again, this has probably only been like 1% of my actual books. 99% of them are digital. And uh, But anyway, I hope it was interesting. But yeah, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Majesty of Reason. And... Peace out. Good Lord, what you don't say, what you don't, I did it just for you, I did it just for you, I did it just for you, and you just don't care. All them other dudes by your side, let them ride off to the sunset, I'm a sunrise, why don't you want to collaborate, even though I may
just ready to celebrate confetti. Show me love when you're ready to, then I'll be chilling. Speak, cause you know I can't read my eyes. Can't spend more time unless I resign. Gotta wait for the stars to realign. You said it all about time, but I just got signed. Why you gotta be all you, all you? Tune is gonna be all me, all me. You gon' see that it's too late. And you gon' say I wish we did it. But I love you, so I'm waiting. Stop procrastinating. Start appreciating. It's not too late. I'm